take too much of your time. Uh, so this is uh, work uh, collaboration with Carlos from Chile. Uh, Jürgen, who's here? Hands up, say hello. Hello, hello Jürgen. Pierre Yves from Fujitsu as well, hands up, hello. Uh, so this was a paper we had accepted for the ISWC 2013 evaluation track which is chaired, co-chaired by Josie. Josie, hello. Hi. <laughs> so, um, it's been made it's, in the family, yeah? It does, yeah, it's all very incestuous. So. Um, so this is more about kind of doing experiments and getting results than a technical paper, okay? And uh, what we wanted to look at was whether or not all these Sparkle endpoints that are available on the web are ready for action and are ready to make applications over. So to start with the visual metaphor, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Anyone any idea what I might be referring to with this metaphor? All those endpoints Richard? and nothing works. <laughs> what does this remind you of? Um, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> the log cloud. Oh, okay. So with the log cloud we have all this data. We have lots and lots of information out there. Uh, but there's not a drop to drink. So how do you access this data? Um, at the moment there are lots of Sparkle endpoints all over the log cloud. Okay, so we could go to these Sparkle endpoints and we could access the data, we can make use of that data. Um, according to the state of the log cloud, there are 201 of the 295 bubbles you see in the log cloud have Sparkle endpoints available, which is about 68%, so a majority. Okay. Also, there's been lots of work on Sparkle over the past few years where we have two standards, Sparkle and Sparkle 1.1, which extends Sparkle, which was recently recommended in March or something like that of this year. Um, we have lots of stores, Virtuoso, Jenna TDB, Stardog, blah, blah, blah. We have about 10, 15 of these, okay? Uh, we have lots of work in benchmarks, Berlin Sparkle Benchmark, Lovem, DBPDS, Sparkle Benchmark, DBPSB, it's the wrong way around. And we have lots of federated engines which look at how to build uh, or how to execute queries over multiple endpoints at the same time, okay? So there's been a lot of work on these federated engines taking a cue from the fact that there's lots of public Sparkle endpoints out there and sometimes you want to answer queries over multiple at the same time. So, lots of work has gone into all this, all this stuff. And uh, if we look at Data Hub, which uh, indexes or catalogs all of the linked open data sets, we can see that it lists 427 Sparkle endpoints out on the web. Okay, so you can go, these endpoints are just URLs, you go to that URL, there's a query service there, you can issue a Sparkle query, you can get results back, you can do whatever you want with those results and so on. Okay, so there's hundreds of uh, public endpoints out there. Okay, <clears throat> but it's not all plain sailing, right? So today's talk is a nautical thing for some reason. I don't know why I made the slide. Uh, so who here has used a public Sparkle endpoint? Hands up. Okay, so we've got about 10, 12 people. Uh, hands up if you had problems with Sparkle endpoints at some stage. Okay, so that's about 100%, right? So you all understand the slide then. Uh, so what kind of problems did you have? Um, I guess. So we have an ocean of Sparkle endpoints, okay? So if we go to query one Sparkle endpoint, we run into all sorts of problems. First, this feature is not supported, okay? You go to the query engine, it doesn't support all these parts of the Sparkle standard because we don't need them anyways, it's okay. okay. So features not supported, we have server errors, okay, we get 500s or 404s, the server fell over, cat got in there or something, tried out some wires. It's a, it's a Guardian computer, isn't it? It's a new top, <laughs> is it? Uh, no, it, but, but from the Guardian newspapers, after the MI6 guys were there? Oh, no idea, could be. Okay. Maybe yeah. MI6 came in and read <laughs> the server firm where the Sparkle endpoint was hosted. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Okay. Uh, slow queries, okay, you send your query, it takes forever to come back, uh, you wait for a couple of hours or whatever, you still don't get any results. And also timeouts, so your query will run for a certain amount of time, and if it doesn't finish within that timeout uh, period, you'll just get back whatever results they had at the time, okay? The other problem is partial results, where uh, when Sparkle endpoints run your query, they'll return you 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 of the top results and not return you any more than that. So that's sort of a self-preservation tactic by then. Okay, so the question we wanted to ask, we had made these observations ourselves, uh, myself, Carlos, Jürgen, and Pierre Yves had seen this uh, in reality, in practice, and we wanted to kind of get a bigger picture of how good or how bad this was for all of the endpoints on the web. Okay. So we asked the question, are Sparkle endpoints ready for action? So the first question we asked was about discoverability. Okay, how do you find the Sparkle endpoints that are relevant for you? So you have a certain application in mind, it might be in the biomedical domain, 
It might be in the music domain, it might be in whatever domain you want, uh, but you need to find public Sparkle endpoints that can issue that you can issue queries to and get results from. Okay, so first question we asked is how discoverable are these endpoints? Okay. So in terms of discoverability, how endpoints could advertise their, their services or their content in particular would be using a vocabulary of interlinked data set, uh, VOID, which was worked on by Richard and Michael, all very incestuous again. Uh, so we have data sets and we have descriptions of data sets, so how many subjects, objects, what vocabularies are used. Okay. And this is a useful description of the content of the endpoints. So they're not just a black box anymore, but you have a description of their content to go on as well. So we looked into how we could get uh, void descriptions for each of the endpoints, and we looked at it for the 427 endpoints that we collected from Data Hub earlier, which was our, our test set, and we found that we could get 33% or for 30 uh, endpoints, we could get a void description on Data Hub describing their content. Okay. From another uh, service called the Void Store, we could get it for about a quarter of the endpoints, and in terms of self-index, it means that the endpoint actually indexed its own uh, void description. To get the void descriptions, we use this query here, but it's not so important. The main message is that we could get void descriptions, descriptions of the content of the endpoints for about a third of the cases. In the other two thirds of the cases, it will be very difficult to know what's actually in the endpoint. So you'll have to go there and try and have issue some queries and so on. The other thing that uh, endpoints could use to describe their services and to, to provide a description of that would be Sparkle 1.1 service description. There we go, March. Um, so that's a recent recommendation on how to describe the features that your endpoint supports. Okay. Uh, so the way of getting that, sorry, is just to dereference the endpoint URL, Let's do dereferencing, follow your nodes. Okay. So what we found was that in about 30, for about 38 endpoints or so, we found uh, that when you dereference it, you found some Sparkle service description uh, data, uh, which is about a tenth of the endpoints. Okay. Uh, more interesting piece of information we could find was from the server fields in the HTTP header, we could find sometimes the engines. Okay, so we could find in 71 cases that the uh, Sparkle engine itself was virtuoso, or that it was forced, or, or that it was Fuseki. Okay, these are more generic ones. Apache, Jetty, you can't identify the server from that. Which is interesting because sometimes these engines support special features like keyword search, and it's nice to know what engine or what vendor you're issuing a query to. Um, but we noted already, just doing a look, look up on the endpoint URL, that about half the endpoints that were listed in Data Hub didn't return anything. Okay, so they were dead at that time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Okay, uh, next we looked at interoperability, where we wanted to see um, if you're issuing Sparkle queries across different endpoints, you want to see that uh, the different endpoints support the same features, so you don't have to write a custom syntax for every different endpoint. You can rely on the standard to be supported by all of the endpoints. Okay. So how to do that? Uh, we took the test uh, queries from Sparkle, from the Sparkle query standard. We took the standard W3C uh, test suite uh, for Sparkle and Sparkle 1.1. We issued a query to each endpoint. Okay. If it returned an error, if it returned an exception, then we deemed that that feature wasn't supported. Okay. If it returned any valid Sparkle query uh, response, like any answers, the answers we couldn't actually validate. We could say that the answers were correct, but we could say that at least we returned a valid Sparkle response. Uh, we said that that feature was supported. So we would expect, for example, if an endpoint didn't support Sparkle 1.1 features, it would throw a syntax error like this. Okay. So we would know that it wouldn't support that feature. But obviously, if the endpoint returns the wrong result because we don't know what content is behind the endpoint, we don't know. We can't validate that. Okay. So, uh, we looked first at the Sparkle 1 features. You don't need to look at all of these uh, strange algebra things here, which are just shortcuts for the type of query asked. Uh, one thing you see is that there's pretty good coverage by the 200 endpoints that are still alive. Okay? Um, but certain features like order by weren't well supported. But generally, there's, there's good coverage of the Sparkle features. Uh, another issue with order by is that if the query is too expensive, sometimes it will actually time out, and we will count that as not supported. Okay. If we look at Sparkle, you know, so it, does it show that uh, support for, for example, ascending and ascending ordering is different? Like if they that's, support? Yeah, so there's a slight difference there, but I'd say that's more to do with timeouts. So if you had, okay. if it timed out every so often, it would. Yeah. So when we're running, all these figures as well could vary like in terms of reproducibility. So if you ran this again, you would probably get different results. 
because you're running it over live HTTP, you know, it's endpoints might be down like five five hundred or temporarily unavailable at one point. So you get these issues. Um, so looking at Sparkle 1.1, uh, which was only just standardized in March, uh, there's one way of two ways of looking at this. One is that Sparkle 1.1 hasn't received much adoption. The other way of looking at it is that Sparkle 1.1 has received great early adoption. So whichever you prefer, we can go with that. Um, we see one feature which is just a syntactic thing, it is well supported already. Uh, but we see certain features like values, which was actually used to be called bindings until a couple of months ago. Uh, there isn't much support for that. Values also isn't supported by Virtuoso in certain cases. Uh, so we see some, some support already for Sparkle 1.1 out there, even though it's just recently standardized. The, the other there are not that many Sparkle query engines out there. Different the vendors, yeah. Different vendors, so, so and, and, and I guess uh, also different versions from the from vendor. Yeah. So, so one way you could have presented this is, is also simply by by showing us uh, the distribution of the version and, and, and vendor we don't, the product, isn't we it? We don't have that information. We can't Sparkle, automatically. Sparkle doesn't allow you to question the query that? No. no. The only way you could get that would be through this. You could sometimes figure out. So some of these actually had, these were like the lemma, hmm. lemmas of the headers. Who's the current editor of the Sparkle query? Well, you could talk to Axel. Yeah. Or, yeah. Is this here? Is anyone else here involved in Sparkle? Working group? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can scrap some information from the like a web page if you have the landing page for queries uh, from the bottom footer. Sometimes it's written this is the this endpoint is version and yeah. running. That's a good idea actually. But at but least for me to also you can get it. But I don't know the others. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's good. and what you're pointing out ultimately in here is the need to ask for what kind of version do you actually support? Yeah, because a lot of the errors and the exceptions we found as well were grouped by the type of engine. So we found, for example, that there were certain engines that would return true for any ask query, which asks if, is, if this data is in there. You could ask anything, and it would return true. And that was one particular engine. There was another engine that had problem, problems with limit. It would run the, uh, so limit is like the count of results you, re you return but it would return limit before doing a distinct. So it would get 100,000 results and then do a distinct and only return you 96,000 or something like that. Right, so all these issues were grouped by vendor. Um, but we couldn't actually detect automatically in, yeah. in an easy, complete way the vendor and ver uh, version. I think that's important feedback for the, for the Sparkle working group. Yeah, it could fit quite neatly into uh, the, sorry, the Sparkle 1.1 service description, which is the standard vocabulary for, for the Sparkle working group. Uh, they could easily extend that, or someone, I mean, this is, it's the semantic web, so yeah. you could go after the meeting today, create a vocabulary and say, use this. Yeah, and, uh, given, given that this is, again, very incestuous, I, I mean, Axel is, I think, a yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, but uh, it's too, too late now because, I mean, it's all standardized, right? So, but there, there will always be an, an next version, yeah. based on feedback, and I think this is important feedback. Yeah, thank you. But I think in the specification it's written that a Sparkle endpoint should return the Sparkle description if you provide an HTTP get. But you don't get the version or the engine or the... See? No, but you get the supported features. And I think the version as well. I mean, the engine is missing. You don't get the engine version though. You don't get like Virtuoso version 4.07 or whatever. You get the Sparkle 1 version. Yeah. You can write the email to the Sparkle. Right. <laughs> Just need to be very convincing about that. Too. Um, but yeah, you can also create, you don't need the Sparkle in one working group. I mean, Boyd didn't come out of the, a working group, for example. Just create an extension to the vocabulary and get people to use it. You're done. Okay. Um, so next we looked at performance. Um, so, okay, you found your query engine or query engines. You um, found that they support the features you want, okay? And now you want to see how fast they can return you results. Okay, so if the results are too slow, that's going to be problematic for your application. Um, so the first thing we want to look at, we talked before about this result cutoff, thing, right? So we're just returning you a certain number of results. So for each endpoint, we issue this query, which is just give me 100,002 results uh, of any triples. Uh, the reason why it's 100,002 is that we can then detect if the cutoff is 100,000. Okay, so. I don't know why it's 100,001, but it's 100,002. Okay. Um, so we looked at the number of endpoints returning uh, fixed thresholds. Okay. And we found that 68 had, were returning a kind of a round number of results, like 100,000 or 50,000. The most common threshold was 10,000. Okay. 
49 endpoints, which is about a quarter of the live endpoints, about an eighth of the total endpoints, were only would only return you 10,000 results no matter how many you ask for. Okay? I think that's a default in Virtuoso. Uh, and others have 100,000. The DBPD Sparkle endpoint, for example, has 50,000. Um, so don't expect to get back all the results that you ask for, uh, especially if the, it's a large result size. I won't go into too much detail here, but we vary the limit size, so we vary this for uh, 100,000, 50,000, 25,000, and so on, um, in a log scale, or in a log progression, and we try to plot the graph. So here we see this big outlier, which is the max value, which was the slowest endpoint for running these queries. Um, but if we just get rid of that, um, we can see the most sensible thing to look at, because there's a positive skew in the data, I'll get back to that later. But the median value, we, you see it actually increases pretty linearly uh, as the limit doubles. Okay? It actually increases super linearly, I would say, which is quite surprising. So actually, the, the cost of running these queries, uh, these expensive queries, aren't dependent on the HTTP connection or a fixed cost, but actually on returning the results. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, like the first table sounds more like an interoperability issue rather than yeah, the, the, like yeah the, the reason why we have it there is just we were running this query for performance and this was sort of the side effect of that, if you know what I mean. So, but you're, you're, you're right, yeah. um, it's more of an interoperability issue. Um, yeah, so next thing we looked at were simple ask queries, very simple queries, which were, uh, does this pattern exist in your data? So it's one triple pattern, does this one triple exist in your data? We just made up URIs here so that it wouldn't return results so that because we don't know what content is behind all the endpoints, we need to create queries that are comparable no matter what the content is. Uh, so we just made up queries Y and Z. It would still have to do a lookup to make sure it wasn't in the data, but it's just one lookup. Okay? And this is what we would call a PO query because the predicate and object are fixed. Okay? Um, so in terms of the types of, this is actually for subject, this is a different, this is just where the subject is fixed. but. Here we see a, a plot of different results. Um, so we see percentiles, this is the minimum, the, the fastest uh, sparkle endpoint, 25th, 50th, which is the median percentile, 75th, 90th, and 100th. So we see that actually this is a log scale as well. So the main message here is that there's different kind of grades of performance where there's orders of magnitude difference between the fastest and the slowest. Um, and this is also the mean, that's the orange uh, bar. But the most interesting one is probably the median, because the median, when the data is positively skewed, it's better to look at. Um, to go quickly through that, uh, we see that the results are all generally quite good. The difference between cold and warm, I should add, is cold was just the first run of the query, and we ran it a second time to check warm cache times to see if you rerun a query, does it get any faster? As you can see, it doesn't really. Actually, sometimes it gets slightly slower. Um, but we also see various like uh, outliers here where a query engine is starting to fall or uh, to fail or fall over. Uh, so we see a lot of kind of very, very slow endpoints there at the, in the higher percentiles. If we look at the median value, it takes about a quarter of a second to run a very simple query in the median case against a public Sparkle endpoint. Uh, something that should return like that, but with the HTTP cost the cost of invoking the endpoint, it's about a quarter of a second in the median case. In the worst case, it can be 20 seconds. In the best case, it can be a tenth of a second, okay? A hundredth of a second, sorry. Uh, the hundredth of the second case, though, I think was a, an internal uh, endpoint in Derry. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why it was so fast. <laughs> or should I say an insight? Um, yes. So, um, Moving on to joins, we wanted to measure not just simple queries, but we wanted to measure how the performance of joins varies. And joins just means that there's multiple patterns, and you want to join on one of the variables in the patterns. The difficult part of that is just that we don't have any data, and we don't know what joins exist in the data. So we created these joins where um, it's forced to create, to run a certain number of uh, join lookups, which is a thousand. Okay? So what we do for that, we just issue an optional and we put a, a URI in there that doesn't have to be there. But the main message anyways is that this will run the same for every endpoint no matter what the content. Okay, so it's just a bit of a trick to force uh, something that's comparable for all the endpoints. So this is a join SS because it's a join in the subject position. Uh, here we see that the, the seconds or the, the response times in the meeting case now are obviously a lot slower. Okay, so, well not a lot slower but 50th is here. So you're talking about just under a second. 
and you can say that a quarter of that second is for the HTTP overhead. So we also did queries for join SO, where the join is in the subject to object position. Okay. Similar enough results. And join OO, where the join is in the object position. Okay. Um, we see that the object position is a lot slower. Uh, we're not really sure why, but there, there's a technical explanation, which is that if O is like a class or has a lot of terms, a lot of triples in the data, then it could generate a lot of, uh, you might have to scan a lot of data to get a thousand unique objects. Okay. But that's not so important. Key thing is that the median case kind of intersecting roughly here is about just under a second or about um, eight tenths of a second or something to run a query, uh, a join query that requires a thousand intermediate lookups. Okay, the main message from all that performance talk is just that we have a lot of positive skew in performance. So this is called the Lorenz curve, uh, where you plot the, the rich against the poor, the fast against the slow. So you order the endpoints according to the fastest, and then you plot the ratio of endpoints and the number, uh, the ratio of time they take. Okay, so an example to explain that will make it much easier. If we take uh, line here, that's 90% of the fastest endpoints. Okay, if we go up to here. Let's say this is the join queries, and we go across, that's 55. So we can say that for the join queries, 90% of the endpoints took 55% of the time. The other 10% uh, took 45% of the time. Okay? So you see that the performance in an overall case is dragged down with these very, very slow endpoints in the positive skew. So this blue line here is the equality. This would be if all the endpoints were as fast as each other. Okay? And the further down here you get, the more positive skew you have. Positive skew being? Positive skew being you have certain endpoints that are like a power law. They're very, very slow very compared slow. to the the, the... the more it is, the more, the more slow, the slower variant you have. Is that, that how yeah, it, so yeah? The, the distribution would be, you know, instead of being a normal distribution, which is nice and symmetric, yeah. you would have something that's like... Yeah, okay. Something like that, yeah. if you can see what I was trying. Yeah. Okay. So the, the core point there is just that there are certain endpoints that are, they will return results, but they'll be a lot slower, uh, orders of magnitude slower than the kind of general, general performance engines. But what you don't know, what you don't know if, if it is a slow system in the sense of a slow implementation or if the machinery behind it is no, no, no idea. Just as a black box interface over HTTP, yeah. that's slow. Yeah. It's the same question about not being able to identify what kind of machine is sitting there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it could be the server is bad, it could be the implementation, the installation, it could be, yeah, any number of factors. Yep. Yeah, did you group these endpoints by the number of triples in them, like somehow, or you just treat them equally? Each we one? treat them equally, uh, because we don't, yeah. Also some factor, like if there is an endpoint with billion triples, if there is an endpoint with 10,000 triples, that yeah. would be like a, but might be different. Absolutely, yeah. So th there are a number of factors we can't, what we can't do is interpret the results in terms of saying this is why this is so slow. But we can say for a consumer perspective, the consumer might not care how many triples are in the endpoint. They only want fast uh, queries, they want fast results. So this is really from that perspective of not really caring and not trying to be almost belligerent and saying, well, these queries are slow. Yeah, you know, but but if you have two endpoints with the same data sets, you might give a hint, this, uh, like, uh, this data set plus some other few, and maybe you don't need that, you want to use this one, because this will be Yeah, that's, it's an interesting direction, and it's something we're kind of getting into now, uh, a little because bit. Because in, in few years, we might have 5,000 endpoints, and then yeah, yeah. We, we, we will have Hundred endpoints with DBpedia, and, and maybe we, one of them, a like, few of them, will have DBpedia plus another thing which you don't need. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're getting into that a little bit. I'll discuss that a little bit later. But um, we don't know. We just don't know what content is in the endpoints mm -hmm. because we they're black boxes. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a valid question, and there are cases at the moment where DBpedia data is stored in several different locations you can choose from. But um, yeah. Um, Okay, so the last thing we looked at was availability. Uh, we looked at the uptimes for public Sparkle endpoints, thanks to PRE, who came along with this fantastic data set of Sparkle endpoint availability. So what PRE was working on, um, taking two simple queries, okay. Uh, if one, if the ask query didn't work, uh, use the select query. Um, I'm going to say we. When I say we, I mean PRE. Okay. <laughs> 
uh, was issuing uh, all endpoints uh, once per hour, uh, these queries, to see if they could return a valid Sparkle response, either a yes or a no. Manually, or manually triggered. Manually triggered every hour. Your Eve has been there. It's, uh, oh, no, I have to go home now. I'm sorry. I have to click the mouse. Yeah. Even at night? Yeah, yeah. That's really nice. It's real dedication. Time out to make it. You can't trust You can't trust computers. If you want something right, you have to do it. If done right, you have to do it yourself. So, um, so and Pierre Yves has been manually clicking this button every hour since 2005. So, um, for the past 27 months, uh, up to the time we were writing the paper. Uh, he's been doing this once an hour, and we, so we know for each endpoint, well, not all the endpoints were online at this time, but um, he's been monitoring, or we've been monitoring, he, we've been monitoring all of the endpoints that are available in uh, CCAM, or Data Hub, at that time. So we've been keeping up to date with that list, so the list has grown over time. We stopped in April 2013 when we were doing the write-up of the paper. Uh, but we know hourly availability for every endpoint that was publicly announced on CCAN since uh, February 2011, which is great. <laughs> um, so we started looking at the availability, and as an overview, uh, quite a pessimistic view to start with, Ooh. but the mean availability of endpoints, considering all of the endpoints um, that are listed in CCAN, has been dropping from about 83%. Okay, so this is monthly availability, I should say as well. Sorry. So all of the hourly pings are aggregated into a monthly ratio. So number of pings succeeded against number of total number of pings. Okay, within that month. Uh, so in terms of the monthly availability, we see it's dropping from 83% uh, to about 50%. Um, so, and the reason why, uh, we could, we explained it a little bit before, we said that 50% of the endpoints are actually dead, they're no longer up or they're no longer uh, accepting queries. Um, that's quite a pessimistic view, if you look at a more optimistic view, like DBpedia, uh, we say that DBpedia has actually quite okay availability, um, at least it's one line availability, so 90%. Um, it varies from month to month, depending on what conferences are on and what you know, the service attacks they get. Okay. Um, so Kasabi, this is the other side of the picture. This is the reason why the mean is dropping. We have lots of endpoints where the service provider, the project has ended, the service, the industry offering it, maybe have decided to go in another direction, the server has died, the person who did the PhD has left, these sort of things. Okay. So we're getting a lot of dead endpoints, um, more and more dead endpoints. Okay. In terms of FactForge is a centralized uh, search engine which offers a Sparkle query uh, interface, a little bit like Syndicate, uh, but we see here the availability is quite good as well. So the other option if you don't want to try your luck with these public Sparkle endpoints would be to try to uh, issue your queries to a centralized service, okay? So they're quite okay. And the log cache, which uh, is hosted by OpenLink, big virtuoso index of 40 billion triples, it's supposed to have the whole log cloud in there. I don't know what that means. Uh, has pretty variable uh, availability. So, in essence, what you could say anecdotally there is that even though the individual endpoints are quite unreliable at times, the solution doesn't seem to be either to bring everything into one Sparkle endpoint under one control of one centralized Google type figure because that will probably run into the same problems as well, okay. at least anecdotally. Um, in terms of the availabilities, if we look at the distribution, uh, what we see, and this is bucketed into single, single digit values, but we see that there is the main message, lots of endpoints have uh, zero availability or close to zero, and lots of endpoints have close to 100. There's kind of a peak here, and then it drops down. So we see that uh, endpoints are often either online all the time or nearly all the time or offline all the time. Okay. If we look at this colorful graph here, um, what we see is the growth, first of all, in the number of endpoints. We see some drops as well. I guess I'm not sure what the drops are. But um, we see the, the growth in the number of endpoints from February 2011. It's, you've seen various kind of peaks like this, which would be to do with maybe one site coming online offering 20 endpoints or something like that, maybe BioTorDF, for example. Um, and you see a gradual uh, evolution of the difference availability. So these are the endpoints which were never really online, or, and eventually more and more went offline. 5 to 75, this is 75 to 95, this is 95 to 99, and this is the two nines availability, 99% at least, which is um, 
quite useful for many applications, but if you consider a federation of endpoints where you have multiple endpoints, yeah. Actually, the, the, the first big augmentation is due to the load cloud diagram release. This one? Or? This one. Oh, yeah. So basically... I, I know you, you sent an email asking for, for people putting, you know, registering their data set in Data Hub, and that's why you have this peak, peak before the September or October. It's nearly August. Exactly. And the that was for the last picture. Interesting. Oh, that's your, that's his fault. It, it's all <laughs> all <laughs> and the the um, the reason why so one one explanation for the increasing amount of red stuff that you see there is simply that we don't really clean up on the data. We don't really remove the yeah. the old data sets there that where as you say people just have gone away. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so maybe we need to do a big. It's not exactly spring now, but a big spring clean there and kind of get get some of the old stuff. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's time to time to get rid of it. As you can see, well, so we can normalize actually this graph. So what we're doing here is just instead of having the count, we stretch it so that it's a ratio. Um, yeah, we see as Richard was saying that the ratio of dead endpoints is just increasing all the time, and it's close to uh, 43, 44 percent, which kind of correlates with what we mentioned earlier about our experiments. Um, so, one, one, one question. That, so, does this increase in availability mean that this is seems to point towards more professionalism? So, more professional organizations um, offering services? Is that that possible interpretation? I, well, one one interpretation, and I guess the one we had in the paper was just that this refers to kind of an experimental phase where people mm -hmm. are trying Sparkle endpoints here putting up Sparkle endpoints and they're registering them just to see if any, they get any, they're, you know, they're fishing, they're looking to see if yeah. they can get any but beta, beta any applications from that. But could, could very well be but that, that a lot of those red are actually indeed, as I said, a PhD student uh, yeah. offering a, a service and if it's now 99% availability, maybe a professional department of, of a company. Yeah, would, the, would offering I like mean, there are a lot of the red here as well that are based on SMEs. I don't know if you count Talus as an SME, or, but they had like 10 or 12 endpoints that went offline pretty much overnight. Uh, so it's not just, you know, people playing around, but there are people who are in it for the long term or in it for the the medium term, let's say, and they've pulled out and they've left dead endpoints as well. So, yeah. Uh, but there are certain endpoints that you would expect to, to remain with high availability and to be well hosted, like the DBPD. Yeah. Um, so it's a mixed picture. Um, so in terms of, I don't know how depressing all those results have been, but um, in terms of silver lining, uh, what can we say? Well, if we just focus, we forget about all the crappy endpoints and we kind of do a spring thing, as Richard was saying, and maybe just focus really on the good stuff, we can say that um, there are endpoints which are offering good availability. I'm not really sure what this inverse peak is here. Why? Well, I, I guess it was probably an ISWC deadline or something like that. Um, but yeah, so we see that there are endpoints that are offering good services with at least two nines, which is quite reasonable. And you can build applications on top of in terms of availability. Same thing goes for performance. Some people, uh, lots of engines have full Sparkle one one compliance. They have descriptions of themselves. They have performance engines and so on. And it's still early days, so you know things will improve over time. Um, so one thing we're working on at the moment. I don't know. Is it okay to show a screen? Yeah, sure, sure. That's that's just um, yeah. Yeah. So Pierre, Yves, and uh, Jurgen have been busy working on a demo that we're going to also demo at ISWC which is really just to showcase all of the results that we have and to be able to browse through all of the different aspects of endpoints to be able to tell the good and the bad and the ugly from each other. Okay, So this is just the front page, but you can drill down more. You can click on any of these interfaces to get more information about all the endpoints. And we're currently working on that and developing that uh, so that people can really find what endpoints. If they want to use an endpoint, they go to here, they see, they do a health check, they do an endpoint status. Uh, uh, look up, they see what the endpoint is like, and they see if it's suitable for their application or not. Okay, so conclusions. Um, first is, okay, analyzing 427 endpoints. Uh, over half are off, now offline. Okay. Discoverability, um, void descriptions available for, available for about a third. Service descriptions just released in March, to add that, disclaimer, available for about a tenth. Not very well described at the moment. Interoperability, good coverage of Sparkle, some features not so well supported, some early support for Sparkle 1.1 as well. Performance, 
uh, endpoints implement result thresholds. Maybe, as you say, that should be an interoperability uh, fight. Um, in terms of queries, 0 0.25 seconds total in the median case is the minimum amount of time it will take to uh, issue a query to a Sparkle engine. Join queries, uh, 0 0.8 milliseconds per result in the median case. Um, positive skew, so 10%, actually that should be more like uh, 4 to 5% of the time, but 10% is at one tenth of the endpoints, the slower endpoints take half the time. So if you have a federation of endpoints, you're issuing queries to 10 different endpoints, you could end up spending half your time waiting on the one slow endpoint. Okay. Especially if you're doing it in parallel. If you're doing it in parallel, you could wait for orders of magnitude longer for that slow endpoint to, to return. Availability. Um, so mean availabilities are declining, but that's just because it's kind of an experimental phase at the moment. People are trying things, they're not working out, the endpoints are going offline, and they're not being removed from the list. Um, but still looking at the positive side, uh, the glass is one third full, uh, so we have at least uh, 20 to 33 percent, depending on the month, endpoints with uh, two nines up times of 99 to 100 percent. So the problems are real. Um, are Sparkle endpoints ready for action? Probably not yet, but there are certain endpoints that are uh, digging in and they're, they're doing a good job. And yeah, that's it. So thanks.